Hello everyone, welcome back to Garden and another POV gardening video. The weather today is absolutely fantastic, just perfect. It's around 16, 17 degrees at the minute. It's late morning and as you can see, the sunlight is still streaming through the garden. If you look up there, you can probably see next to us cherry tree, absolutely covered in blossom. It really does look fantastic and it's a great backdrop to my tree ferns and these gunners here. Personally, I think this time of year is definitely one of my favourites. Yes, I know a lot of the truly tropical plants haven't really got going yet, but just that vibrancy, that energy, that's something that I'm really keen to actually enjoy in my garden this year, like any other year, I suppose. And today, we're concentrating on some jungle planting. We're currently in my jungle clearing area, and as you can see down here, the main plants at the minute are the Gunra manicata. They're just starting to come into growth. That is one of the smaller divisions I took a few years ago. This one here is my main plant. And as you can see, it's already building quite a sizable base now and really starting to throw those big leaves up. And here's the third one. Again, you can see just how lime, lime green and vibrant they are. Absolutely fantastic plants. And from this point going forwards, they're gonna size up really rapidly. So that plant will be somewhere out here in just a few short weeks. It really is incredible to see. But today we're concentrating on this area here. Now, I haven't really featured this area too much, I will be doing a full spring garden tour very soon, as soon as I've had time to actually do a bit of weeding. If you look over here, you can see we're definitely keeping it real. Look at the amount of weeds just scattered around the place. So as soon as I've had a bit of a tidy up and some of the things have really started to burst into growth, I'll be doing a full tour of the garden. My plans for this spring and the things that are really progressing well just by themselves this year. But today I'm focusing on this area here. And as you can see, I've got a small jungle pond there. Now, this is something I didn't specifically cover in a video, but I put it in myself last year. It was just a really small, cheap pond off Amazon. I'll put a link to it in the description below. Only a very small pond, but it really does the job. I wanted a little bit of water here to kind of give a little bit of a focal point as you're walking past, and also to help all the sort of insects and other wildlife that uses the garden. If you have a pond, you have less slugs and snails, so it's definitely a great component in that battle. But today I want to focus on something that you could say it's a planting mistake or you could say it's something that I'm evolving. We'll stick with evolving, definitely not my fault. And that's moving this Xantodesia here. I want to move that to the other side of the pond and then plant some of these amazing ferns around it to really give it that lush sort of tropical jungle vibe. The main reason I'm moving a Xantodesia, this is Xantodesia, either White Giant or Hercules. One of them's got the spots in it, the other hasn't, but either plant, they're absolutely colossal. I don't know if you've seen these before, but they're basically like an arum lily, absolutely huge. Big white flowers that get to maybe a metre and a half, two metres plus tall, that absolutely rise out of them. And the leaves, they get probably twice the size of that, maybe even bigger. It's definitely a plant with real impact. And here, it's sort of cramped a little bit next to that gunnery. So it's time to move it to the other side, to this spot here. Now, originally, I had a banana there, and my thinking was to have a banana there, then the other moves the Bajdu banana over that side. But at the minute, I don't really want too much symmetry. And also, I think, if you had a tall banana there, it might obscure your view of the wacky palm over there. I really like the structure and height that gives the border. So to me, it's about creating space practically for the plants, so that gunnera isn't pushing into the Xantodesia, and also making the border flow better. So you've got this gunnera filling this space here. It's got plenty of room around it with any low growing plants like hostas and ferns. And then this spot here, you've got the perfect place, nice damp soil, it'll absolutely be perfect for that Xantodesia. So that's my main reasoning behind it. Give each plant the space it needs to really show off. And then it opens up lots of opportunities. Opportunities for plants like the ferns, which are great complementary plants, great companion plants to all of the exotics, especially if you've got a damp, shady spot. So first things first then, I'm gonna take your Xantodesia out of the ground. And the main reason that I'm doing this now is because it's spring, the ground's still quite moist, but it's also relatively warm, or at least it's slowly started to warm up. I wouldn't do this in winter because it might actually shock the plant a little bit. So you don't really want to compound the stress of cold weather by also then moving it. And likewise in summer, when it's in full growth, the ground's quite dry, it would really take a lot of watering to prevent it being set back. So now is the perfect time. And obviously, one of the main concerns about digging this out is that I don't damage the gunner next to it. So I'm just gonna dig quite close to the Xantodesia. They really are very tough plants. And this one was only a very small offset they got given last spring anyway. So it'll cope with things perfectly fine. So let's get this one dug out.
so I can go a bit further this way. Probably notice my stylish little Dunlop well is also worn with socks for extra style points. <laughs> to be honest with you, I actually got these from Amazon. Again, I'll put a link in the description. They were less than a tenner, but they're perfect garden footwear. I think I prefer to think of them as more sporty, lightweight wellies than uh, Crocs with the holes filled in. But either way, deeply, deeply fashionable. So I think I'll go something like that. Should hopefully give it a nice root ball. You can probably see there the Persa Carrier. I'm not worried about damaging that. Those are really tough plants. They can take pretty much anything and just still grow back. And that plant there is designed to slowly spill over the pond, come over this side, over the edge of the border, and just really sort of break down the formal feel of the garden, make everything seem a little bit looser and more wild. That's the purpose of that plant. And some ferns, whilst they might be slightly obscured by it when it's in full growth, you can very easily chop that back. And I think the ferns will really help soften the whole area. It actually seems quite well rooted to be honest with you. So I'm gonna walk around the other side of it. That's a Hosta Empress Woo, being careful not to damage that. Don't know if you can see it down there, but there's a Hosta, that's some substance. So again, I'll be careful to avoid that. These weeds on the other hand, I'm definitely not worried about stamping on them. So as you can see, there's all kinds of tweaks and stuff, but I generally like to be quite easy going about these and leave plenty down for insects and wildlife to enjoy. So, standing a little bit more carefully. We'll get the Zantadisha dug out. Really is removing plants, just a case of getting as much root ball as you can. That's the number one tip for transplanting anything. Plants like this, they really shouldn't actually notice being transplanted, especially at this time of year but you can give them the best start by getting as much root ball as possible. Try to get under the whole thing. As you can see, it's actually splitting into two, which isn't the end of the world. It gives me two plants. So I'll just carefully pick my way around. So what started off as a video on moving this plant might end up on one dividing, but there we go. It absolutely has. So you can see there, I actually ended up with two separate plants. So just nipped inside for a quick drink. There we can see the two Xantodesia. I believe, I might be wrong, but the one with the white spots is actually White Giant and there's also Hercules as well. But either way, I'll probably put the name on the screen now when I do a quick bit of Google and after video. Either way, it doesn't matter. They're both fantastic plants, absolutely colossal beasts. So what I've actually done is just basically top the holes up with a little bit of compost because the original banana that came out of there took up quite a bit more room. I want the area sunken down a little bit to keep it wetter, but I don't want a complete hole in the garden. And then because I'm digging out two quite big root balls from there, again, I just put some compost in the base. I could have just used some sort of soil from elsewhere in the garden, but at the minute I don't have any, so that's filled in quite nicely. So the next step then is to get one of these pretty quickly into the ground down there. And here you can just imagine it's got the room to really expand. At the back there, you can see various ferns. We've got a Scheffler that will grow quite tall, hopefully, and out of the spot. So really, this will be the perfect spot. A little bit of shade from that fantastic cherry tree up there, shelter from the strong winds, and really the room for it to absolutely perform. So let's get a whole dug for it then. I suppose really I could have actually dug it in and then put the compost around it. That would have been sensible, but keeping it real and everything. So let's get it dug in there. Let's get that stick out of the way. So that should be about right. As you can see the tree ferns, some of them are a little bit brown from this winter, the ones that are more exposed anyway. The ones that are further back of the border, they're generally more green. 
But either way, we're heading now to that exciting time of year when the new fronds open up. Definitely one of my favorite things to see in spring. So I think what we'll do is plant the larger one and then I've got a spare plant for somewhere else in the garden. And as you can see this one, it's already got a smaller plant on the side there, which is nearly about big enough to split off by itself, but not quite yet. So, being quite careful. Mainly careful not to actually fall over. I'm going to plant it somewhere there. Obviously get it a bit more upright. But to be honest, that doesn't look too bad. I've got the depth about right. So what I'll do now, just firm the compost around it. Just like that. So what I'm doing, like with every other area in the garden, is planting the main structural plants in first. They don't always have to be evergreen or woody, but the plants I know will get the biggest and really fill out most of the border. And then it's the more accessory or filler plants around them. You've got time to actually pair the right plants in the right spots and to get the target look for the area. So I'll just heal that in a little bit. I've tilted it a little bit back, but it's not the end of the world. So just very gently, gently but firm. <laughs> Something like that, I am happy with that. So yes, it will sit a little bit lower than the surrounding area, but I'm not at all concerned that I hopefully keep the soil a little bit damper. So I'm happy with that there. It's now time to do some more planting around here. So like I said, you've got the persicaria there. That is a fantastic plant. I think that one's Red Dragon. In fact, I know it is. It's a beauty. It does get quite tall. So potentially this year, that could actually get up above this tree fern front here. I don't really want it completely dominating the area. So it might take a little bit of chopping back. But those are plants who can absolutely handle it. You can literally do anything to them and they'll still grow back. So it's time to put some accessory plants around it. Plants that won't trouble the gunnera, plants that will really sort of soften the edges and help bring this sort of stone structure around the edge of the pond. That big log there, covered in ivy. I really think that looks fantastic. And my brother got me that. It was from a tree they chopped down. I thought, yes, it's not great firewood, but it's something that will really set off this part of the garden. So I really want to soften the edges of that. And that's where ferns come in. Now, I don't know if you saw my last video, an exotic nursery tour, looking around London nurseries, but these are some of the ferns I got from there. Unfortunately, I think they got quite battered in the wind we've had this week. But what we've got is another Dryopteris. This is the Trata. Not one I've actually grown myself here before. But I really like just how sort of unusual the fronds are. Rising up. And I think this will make a great addition to this area. So I think the key with ferns is plenty of variety. Loads of different greens. Loads of different leaf shapes. And really pack them into your garden. You have to just ignore the dandelion manettel over there. So I'm thinking that one can go somewhere like that. So it's got enough room just to fill out nicely, but it doesn't matter too much as the purse carrier overshadows it a little bit. And then what I'm thinking is fully deserving of a more forward spot is this one here, which is a polystichum, I presume that's how you pronounce it. It's a fantastic one, this. It's got really glossy fronds. That was the main thing that drew me to it. It's got a great sort of contrast to that fern, and I think it's something that will definitely be appreciated at the front of the border. So I'm thinking something like that, so it can just hang over the edge of the stonework. I think I like the look of that, so we'll go with that there. Then here we've got another fern. This one, another Dryptris atrata. So what I think with this is, I like to generally keep the same themes running through the borders. That might mean the same plants or similar plants, similar structures. But to me, this is a fern that I think look fantastic. Again, just leaning over the edge of the pond there. You can see already that really helps to soften the edge, make the whole thing look more natural. See, so yes, that's sort of coming together. I like the repetition there. Ferns that side, ferns that side. Ferns are a great plant, I think, if you've got a shady border or quite damp soil, 
and it doesn't quite look like a jungle garden yet, which is exactly the issue I've got here. There's lots of really great specimen plants, and at this time of year, yes, we're waiting for them to really fill out, but it's all about filling those gaps in, making it look less like a border and more like a proper sort of natural, authentic jungle type area. And it's ferns that just spill over the edges. They're a great tip to achieve in that. So next up then, we've got a couple of smaller ferns, both the same, and these Blechnum spicant, presume it's pronounced. These are a fantastic smaller fern, very dainty. They still get a good bit bigger than this, but what I'm gonna do with these is basically plant them even closer to the edge there. So again, use them to soften the edges. I wouldn't plant any of these ferns right in the middle of a border. They're not a plant that's a specimen plant and they will prefer a bit of shade, a bit of shelter and the extra humidity in an area like this. So we've got another one of the same, which I will probably put, those persicari are gonna get quite big there. And I've got hardy and patians at the back. So what I'm thinking is, I just walk over the planting I've just done, which you shouldn't really do, but I'm doing, because I'm a maverick. That'll probably go there. Quite like the look of that. This tree fern, I should say, it's a Dixonia Antarctica. I planted it at an angle, and it's got mind your business growing up the trunk. This one was a bit of a rescue fern. It wasn't doing especially well. I got the chance to actually get it into my garden myself. So it's definitely gonna need a bit of TLC to really get those big fronds. But hopefully over the next few years, consistent watering, a lovely damp shady spot like this, it should really fill out and completely dominate this area. So I'm really looking forward to seeing that size up. But these smaller ferns, they help sort of repeat the same foliage type. So you've got the big fern there, smaller ferns at low level, and hopefully the whole border will just flow really nicely. We've also got a small hosta, but that potentially will go in that spot over there. So the next thing we need to do is get some holes dug. And I'll probably just do it with a spade because it literally is here and I'm lazy. So what we'll do first is get the little black them in. Tell you what, isn't it fantastic to have some actual consistent, I won't say warm weather every single day, but not cold. <laughs> Definitely makes coming out into the garden even more enjoyable. There you can actually see one of the stems of the first carrot from last year. It does get pretty big, but grows again from the base every single year. No matter how, how cold the winter is, it'll still grow back. So I'll just try to carve a bit more of that away. This is probably another spot where I should have used a small trowel, but we're going for it anyway. A little bit of rope there. Why is it that whatever your, whatever your garden soil is, wherever you live, there's always random bits of stuff in your garden. So we'll just pop that over here. And pop that in the bin. So time then to get the little plaque them in. Put that down there for now. So as you can see, lovely healthy little plant, very delicate, very dainty. So to me, this is a plant that needs to go near the front. So yes, it will get quite overshadowed by the purse carrier from this direction, but there you'll still see the little dainty fronds hanging over the edge of the pond. And it looks great against that sort of natural old ivy there. So I'm happy with that. So I'll just firm the soil in. So what I'm thinking is something like that. So I'm happy with how that looks. Oh, I've got another worm there. Look at the size of that. Nice little worm, isn't it? Let's see if we can get into the ground before one of the birds gets it. So now I'll take this one out of the pot. What you tend to find with ferns, I put loads in the garden, but only really the strong ones really dominate and thrive the space. Some of them can tend to sort of slowly wither away, but a lot of the dryopteris and hopefully this polystichum 
will hopefully be tough enough and happy enough in the spot to really settle in well. I'm not saying you need to chuck loads of plants in just so one or two survive, but I think with ferns especially, they pretty soon let you know if they're happy or not. And if they're happy, they absolutely thrive. So I'm just gonna go down here. In summer, I might have some colocasias and other plants like that in the same spot. But again, this will fit in absolutely fine. Beautiful green leaves. There's so many worms here, isn't there? I think that's one of the benefits of uh, organically feeding the soil. And when I say organic, it doesn't have to mean, you know, going to absolute long lengths to not use anything unnatural. It just literally means use the good stuff. Use a farmyard manure, use a soil improver. There's so many things that you can do to not only feed your plants, but actually improve the quality of the soil. And if you do that, it's so much better than just pouring fertilizer on week after week in the summer months. Yes, your plants will get bigger the first year, but they also become reliant on it. And you actually harm a lot of the beneficial bacteria in the soil. So I'm a big fan of using mulches and adding lots of manure. As you can probably tell, looking over there, it really seeps into the soil and feeds all those worms. So let's move on to this drought tris at the back. See that started to come out of the pot. Ferns can actually have pretty dominant root systems. I know tree ferns, especially like that one, you buy them as bare trunks most of the time and people assumed in the past they didn't need much soil. Yes, they can grow as a bare trunk, but the reality is if you plant them in the right spot, the roots become a really thick mat. So that one might actually take quite a bit of water from the gunners in the future. So this area, like I said in the previous video, this isn't a water-wise garden area. This is certainly part of the garden that I have to water fairly regularly. But to me, it's absolutely worth it. When you see these plants in late summer, even midsummer, they're sized up really well. So this one typically is proving quite hard to get out of the pot. So I'm just gonna get a good strong grasp of the root ball. It's obviously been in quite a damp tray and it's rooted under the pot. Typically it's when I'm doing the videos without much editing that this always happens. So I think I might just have to tease some of these roots away at the base. It won't harm the plant especially. See most of, there are, most of them are still intact. Just look at those amazing patterns on there. Very swirly, sort of almost orangey colour to them. So, look, another monster worm down there. Look at the size of it. Some huge worms in the garden today. So what we'll do is very carefully move him out of the way. That would make a lovely treat for any blackbird or robin, wouldn't it? So we'll just pop you over there for now, mate. And then dig just a hole that's just big enough for the dry uptress to go in. You see that the gunner roots are actually reaching out into this area. So I think when you're planting up any shady area, you need to be quite mindful of what the soil's like because you can have areas that are dry shade, areas where a tree completely sucks all the moisture from the ground. That's not the best spot for plants like the Gunnera. Generally speaking, any plant with big leaves, it really needs a nice damp spot. But if you've got a place like this, where that shade from the sun really helps keep more moisture in the soil, it's perfect for Gunnera, perfect for Regersia, ferns, any of these sort of damp garden beauties. So, just reaching in, if I can balance on that stonework there, we'll just pop the fern in. Again, nothing fancy about this, just literally pushing the soil up around it, firming it in, something like that. So I'm happy with that. And do you know what I might do? I might actually find a home for this hosta just in the middle there. So smaller hostas like this, I bought this one because it was really cheap. It's got the old orange sticker on it, which means it was half price. I don't really use them as statement plants or specimen plants in their own right. 
look at the slugs there see it's not even started growing yet they're already here i'll let some bird eat them plants like this i don't use them as specimen plants as such but more filler plants and i think hostas again if you saw my nursery tour video there's so many different varieties and the great accessories to the big leaf plants so what i'll do with this one this will go somewhere in the middle there i think and i can literally just dig this out with my hands so i'm happy with that the persicary like i said that'll get massive that's the main plant for this area but i don't mind that it's all about the small accessory plants that will hopefully fill out quite nicely and really soften the edges i'm happy with the look of it i like all the green now i think that green really helps tie the whole border together and like i said it really helps link that tree fern with the ground planting so now let's plant the other ferns around here so starting off then we'll start with the back one that would make sense wouldn't it small blacknum i don't know if you can hear in the background or how good this mic is but you can hear people doing their own garden jobs i think it's just nice to hear all the activity playing in the distance people just getting on i think really it's that buzz of activity that really makes this time of year so special here in the uk after such a long winter when no one can be bothered to go outside it's finally time to come out in the garden and make some progress so let's get you popped in down here so i think that is about perfect there and then a nice little spot there for the dryopteris at this front side of the pond Look there another slug hiding out again push it down there let a bird eat it you might have seen when i unpacked the gunnera there was a small frog under there so it's great having a small pond like this even a small pond i can see all kinds of little bugs in the bottom of it from here it must be great in terms of its capacity of attracting these wildlife the wildlife like the frogs the toads even birds drink from it i've seen them before so you don't have to have a big garden to do something good for wildlife and i've heard it time and time again but having a small pond it really is a fantastic thing that you can do for your part of the world so i'll just dig out some more of that soil there just loosen up a little bit so you can see that soil further down it is actually quite clay really which is probably why this area is so damp and great for all these plants and one of the best things about clay everyone talks it like like it's a problem clay really holds on to the moisture and clay is full of nutrients and both of those are things that are fantastic if you plant the right plants so it's not the best spot for palms like maybe camerops shamrops where they want a well-drained sunny spot but for these big leaf jungle beauties, it's absolutely perfect. So, just firm that in. And already, not blowing my own trumpet here, but I think they look fantastic. They've already helped to soften the area. And as that pond's filled up a little bit more, you won't see the black plastic around it. That Xantodesia will fill up really nicely, completely take over this spot here. And looking further back you've got the ferns fatsia another sheffler that big leaf beauty at the back there that is an absolutely fantastic hydrangea it's hydrangea aspera bellevue absolutely colossal leaves and that it really does look an amazing plant you wouldn't have thought the hydrangeas would really fit in with my exotic vibe but when you see pictures of that when it's mature it absolutely does so the thinking is really here this part of the border all those plants at the back they're going to get a good bit taller so you've got Barinda papyrifera there, the bamboo. That's going to fill up nicely, give some real height to this area here. A bit of screening and really help to filter some of that early morning light through. Then you've got the fats here in the Scheffler. And here, I've not planted them to become really dense bushes. They're more to reach up through the canopy. I like gardens, well, private gardens like Alternative Eden. I don't know if you've seen Mark and Gaz's garden, but it's a fantastic example of jungle planting. 
and they've got all kinds of chefflers winding their way up through the canopy. That's the look that I want to create here, that sort of genuine jungle. And it's only by using plants like these that will seek out the sun that it'll absolutely get there. But then as well as the taller plants, there's all kinds of other low level planting, which I'm really looking forward to actually seeing fill out this year. So, just a little wren hopping around behind me now. It's now time to get them watered in. You can probably hear all those dogs barking in the background, but I don't care, because listen to the sound of the water hitting the gunner leaves. Even this small size, that really is one of my favorite sounds in summer. When you're in the garden and it's raining and you can just hear the water slowly hitting those huge leaves, it really is fantastic. So what we're doing now, the sun's gone in a bit, so I'm not gonna burn the plants. A lot of people don't recommend watering in midday because the sun can literally shine through the droplets and actually cause damage for leaves. But there's actually a little bit of shade at the minute, so it's not too bad. So I'm just giving the plants a really good soaking in. Especially as we've got some dry weather at the minute over the weekend. Anything new you plant in your garden, even if it's a plant that actually prefers a dry spot, it's well worth watering it in. And it's not just about providing water for the plants, it's also about settling that soil down around them and filling in the air gaps. What I might even do with these plants, give them a little bit of extra TLC and actually give them a mulch of manure to really help trap this moisture in. I've done a video in the past all about mulching it genuinely is, you won't just hear it from me, you'll hear it from a lot of gardeners, one of the best single things you can do for your garden. And it's great to do it at this time of year, when the ground's quite moist, you're trapping all that moisture in for summer. So it reduces the amount of watering you need to do, keeps the plants happier, keeps the weeds down, and of course it adds lots of nutrients and structure to the soil as well. So this is Antidesia, I'd like to think that it won't even notice it's been transplanted. And with this rich soil, plenty of water, and a good bit to feed a liquid seaweed or something, it should really start growing pretty much straight away. I do like the sound of that water just hitting the surface of the pond. Now, I know at the minute my channel is a bit of a weird mixture of say budget tropical gardening and then larger specimen plants. And I think it's a style of gardening that really, it has got something for everyone, for every budget. But I think places like this pond just show that not every plant in your garden has to be a specimen plant. Yes, the tree fern can be quite expensive. They're definitely expensive this year. But to get the overall look, it's not just about that tree fern. It's about plants like the Gunnera that size up really quickly from a small plant. You can actually buy these from a lot of aquatic nurseries. They're the best places to go for them. And also if you go down to Cornwall, a lot of the big gardens there, they often sell them in their plant shops as well. But plants like these ferns, a lot of them were $3.99 each, which isn't a ridiculous amount of money. The pond itself, again, I'll put a link to it in the description below, that was maybe upper 20s, around 30 pounds, somewhere around there. And the stones, like pretty much every other stone in my garden, those were a Facebook marketplace buy. I just bought sort of job lots of York stone. Then when we moved in, yes, it took a lot of work, but I've sort of found a home for everything. And over time, they'll get a nice sort of green sheen to them as the moss grows on them, and I hope it will really help tie the garden together. So as an overall thing, you could build a project like this for not much more than maybe 50, 60 pounds, and I think it will bring so much to your garden. You could go down the route of having some kind of water feature in there, some little solar sprinkler, but for me, that's not what this area is about. It's about adding to that natural beauty and also performing a practical function in the garden. A place that will help bring those frogs, the toads, somewhere for the birds to drink and it will really be something that actually reduces the amount of slugs in the garden. So, I am pretty much happy with that. They'll soak in nicely and with it being quite warm over the next few days, I'll give them another good soaking tomorrow night. But, I'm very happy with that and how they'll help blend the whole area in. <laughs> 